أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشافع أنفسنا عبد القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to send His peace and blessings upon Fatima and her respected father. The Holy Prophet of Islam upon her respected husband, the first successor to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa namely Amir al Mu'mineen Alayhi Salam, and I ask her I ask Allah Azza to send his blessings upon her children, including Al Hassan and Al Hussein, the two Imams, and the martyred Shaheed Mahsan, also upon her daughters, dear viewers brothers and sisters in Islam, and indeed any viewers of faiths other than the religion of Islam, I welcome you to the second episode of this program here on the Imam Hussein channel, namely from the laws of Zahra alayhi salam. As was mentioned in the first episode of this program, it is necessary for us to enter into several what we would refer to in Arabic as muqaddamat, several preliminary discussions pre prior to being able to enter into the real depth and essence of our discussion here in this show, namely the laws which we are able to derive from the numerous speeches and ahadith or narrations we have narrated from Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. And indeed in the previous episode I alluded to some small details and a small amount of information pertaining to the great author and compiler of these works, namely Imam Muhammad al husseini al-Shirazi rahmatullah alayhi, who was one of the great maraja taqlid or grand sources of emulation for the Shia within his lifetime. And we alluded to some of the more memorable aspects of his life and indeed some of the more tragic aspects that were said about him by those who maybe took a less than favorable view of him and we responded to some of those things. Indeed in today's episodes we must look at some more preliminary discussions prior to entering into the real substance of the discussion and today that's why we're going to look at several questions questions which I believe are of the utmost importance in discussing this issue in order for us to understand the great need for us to look at such a work such as the laws of Zahra and what the benefit of looking at such a work is to the Muslim Ummah. We find that today there is a real misunderstanding particularly amongst us Shias in the West in regards to who the Masumin are and indeed it would not be it would not be wrong or erroneous for me to make clear that many of us have felt that the Masumin, whilst we have benefited from hearing of their fawail, their merits, the favors which were bestowed upon them, the exclusive qualities which they possessed, they alone possessed to the exclusion of others, and we have benefited from understanding these distinct qualities. We've understood from the minbar, from the pulpits of our speakers that these individuals, particularly the Ahlul Kisa, those who were under the cloak of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa the five members, namely Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Amir al-Mu'mineen Alayhi Salam, Al-Hasan and al Hussein and Sayyidah Fatima, that they have distinct qualities which no one else had. We might indeed occasionally be aware of certain things which happen to them in their lives, but rarely ever are we given an insight into some of their teachings, into some of the aspects which they taught from their lives, particularly with a figure such as Sayyidah Fatimata Zahra. And indeed there are numerous reasons for that. It is certainly not an accidental factor that we possess in comparison to the other Masumin, a rear a very real lack of traditions from Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra. What do I mean when I say that we possess a lack of traditions 
from Sayyidina Fatima al Zahra relatively. That is not to say that we do not possess real treasure and real gold and real quotes of substance from Sayyidina Fatima al Zahra. But that is to say that we, unfortunately, when we compare the amount of narrations which have come down to us from Sayyidina Fatima al Zahra, alayhi salam, even including Imams such as Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein, and even to some degree Amir al Mu'mineen, we would find that relatively speaking, these are in a real lack in comparison to the traditions narrated to us from the two Imams, Imam al Baqir and Imam al Sadiq. Now, there are numerous reasons for that. We find that within history, chances and opportunities arose amongst the Shia community, which allowed these two Imams to narrate much more than the previous Imams. Of course, now when I say that, whilst I've said that if we compare the amount of traditions narrated from Al-Baqir and As-Sadiq to the amounts narrated by the Ahl al-Kisa, we would find it is a tiny amount in comparison to Al-Baqir and As-Sadiq When we compare within the Ahl al-Kisa, the narrations attributed to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam al-Hassan, Imam al hussein and we compare them to the narrations attributed to Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, we would find that we have even less narrations from her. Now, there needs to be several questions asked here. Before we go into the topic of who is Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, which is a crucial discussion in this show naturally as we were talking about the laws of Zahra, may peace and blessings be upon her, we need to understand the factors which have led us to discuss these particular incidents from which we will be deriving laws, from which we will be deriving certain benefits which we can implement in our lives. Muhammad al-Shirazi, Imam Muhammad al-Husseini al-Shirazi, in order for me to give him the adequate respect due was not an individual who decided to look at all the narrations of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra whilst compiling his book Min Fiqh al-Zahra from the laws of Zahra. Rather, he concerned himself primarily with two literary narrations from the great lady of ladies from amongst the people of paradise and from amongst the people of all times. He concerned himself with particularly two narrations. Number one, Hadith al-Kisa. Hadith al-Kisa, of course, being the narrative in which it is narrated how the Ahl al-Bayt had the ayah of Tathir revealed upon them. Now, that is not to say that the Ahl al-Bayt previous to such a revelation were not infallible or were not sinless. Rather, we believe that sin has never touched or never emanated from the personalities of the Ahl al-Bayt since the beginning of their births until their deaths. Rather, this was merely an event which was a cause for the Muslims to understand the great status of the Ahl al-Bayt in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal. When we look at that narration, we find that Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam has a particular narrative of that event. Now, some have come forwards and said, well, the famous Hadith al-Kisa, of course, occurs in the house of Umm Salama, Rahmatullah alayha wa radiyallahu anha, the wife of the Holy Prophets. And some folk come forward and say, therefore it contradicts the narrative in which Hadith al-Kisa is narrated in the house of Fatima al-Zahra. Others come forward and like to point out the lack of textual sources we have for the long narration attributed to Fatima al-Zahra alayha salam. In response to this, there are a few points that must be bear, borne into consideration. It is not necessary for us to dismiss one event on the basis that we have two events which have a resemblance and which are the cause of or reason for the revelation of an eye of the Qur'an. For even the scholars of the Mukhallifin and the scholars of the Imamiyya, our Shia scholars, are agreed that an ayah of the Qur'an can be revealed twice in different times and upon different, lo and upon different occasions, but the same ayah can be revealed. Some ayahs were repeatedly revealed in order to give us an emphasis. Likewise, we find that Allah Azza wa wished to reveal ayah to twice, 
specifically giving us particular details on one occasion and giving us other details on the other occasion. We find that this narration it makes up the first volume of Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi's Minfiq al-Zahra. And it is used to justify certain cosmological statuses which we, the Muslims, believe Fatima al-Zahra held. However, that will not be the main crux of the discussion in this show. In this show, we will be looking at the second narration, which forms the main crux of the other three volumes of the set Minfiq al-Zahra, by the great Imam Muhammad al husseini al-Shirazi. And just to point out to our viewers who are maybe not of a Shi'i background and who are not of a Muslim background, we the Shia believe in 12 infallible Imams. And we believe normally that they are the people who we give title, the title of Imam to. So when I say Imam Muhammad al husseini al-Shirazi, I do not mean that he is from amongst the infallible Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, Rather, this is a title of appreciation, a title of praise we've given to the particular scholar because of his great works in the field of Islamic jurisprudence and indeed in Islamic thought. Coming back to the main point, when we look at the work, Min Fiqh al-Zahra from volume 2 to volume 4, it is based primarily upon the khutbah of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra in which she demanded her rights after the martyrdom of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We find that this forms possibly what could be the first contention amongst both our Shi'i viewers and amongst the viewers who maybe come from other schools of Islamic thought. Some people might ask, why is it we feel the need to perpetually discuss points of contention within history? Surely history has passed and we as Muslims can now move on from history. We can move on and we can look at the present day. In response to this, I believe it is pertinent to point out that we as Muslims are living the effects of what was previous history. The present is merely a reflection of what the past brought to us. And therefore, whilst these issues are issues of contention, would it be fair for us as people who call ourselves the Shia of Ali Muhammad to neglect mentioning what happened in these specific occasions due to its raising a bone of contention in the eyes of other Muslims? We will answer this question, dear viewers, after the break. And I hope you join me thereafter in order for us to continue this episode of The Laws of Zahra. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Muhammad Shirazi was the religious authority merged to millions of Shia Muslim around the globe. A charismatic leader who is known for his high moral values, modesty and spirituality. He is a mentor and source of aspiration to the millions and the means of access to authentic knowledge and teachings of Islam. He has made extensive contributions in fields of learning ranging from jurisprudence and theology to politics, economics, law, and sociology. Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi was born in the holy city of Najaf, Iraq in 1374 after Hijra, 1927 AD. He belongs to a distinguished family deeply rooted in Islamic science, literature, and virtue. His followers are found in many countries in the global, Grand Ayatollah Shirazi was distinguished for his intellectual ability and holistic vision. He was recognized for his clear ideas and realistic solutions to issues of concern to mankind. He has written various specialized studies that are concerned to be among the most important references in the Islamic sciences of beliefs and doctrine, ethics, politics, economics, sociology, law, human rights, etc. He has enriched the world with his staggering contributions of some 1300 books, treaties, and studies on various branches of learning. His works range from simple introductory books for the young generations to literary and scientific masterpieces. Deeply rooted in the Holy Quran and the teachings of the Prophet of Islam, his visions and theories covers areas as politics, economics, government, management, sociology, theology, philosophy, history, and Islamic law. 
His work on Islamic jurisprudence, for example, constitutes 150 volumes which run into more than 55,000 pages. Through his original thoughts and ideas, he has championed the causes of issues such as the family, human rights, freedom of expression, political pluralism, non-violence, and shura or consultative system of leadership. Grand Ayatollah Shirazi believes in the fundamental and elementary nature of freedom in mankind. He calls for freedom of expressions, political plurality, debate and discussion, tolerance and forgiveness. He strongly believes in the consultative system of leadership and calls for the establishment of the leadership council of religious authorities. He calls for the establishment of the universal Islamic government to encompass all the Muslim countries. Dear viewers, welcome back to your episode of From the Laws of Zahra. Prior to the break, we were discussing the great and crucial question, which I believe is one which must be given prior to entering into the real depth of the discussion, that is the laws we can extract according to the view of the great marja of the Muslims, Imam Muhammad al husseini al-Shirazi, from his book The Laws of Zahra, in which he discusses the great laws we can extract from the khutbah of Sayyid of Fatima al-Zahra. Now, the Shia, who are aware of this discussion, would be more than aware that this khutbah was a khutbah given on the occasion of what we believe was the usurpation of the successorship of the true successor of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, namely Amir al-Mu'mineen. Now, of course, the non-Muslim viewers and any viewers from any Muslim background will be more than aware if they have the most basic information about the religion of Islam, that this raises to some degree a bone of contention. And this is what we, we had started to discuss prior to the break. How does it raise a bone of contention? It raises a bone of contention in numerous ways. Namely, if we accept that we, the Shia, believe that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam was the true successor to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and as I said we believe that that successorship was usurped or the worldly seat of successorship should we say was usurped for indeed the position of divine successorship can never be usurped in its true sense merely the physical manifestation or application of that successorship can be usurped then naturally if there are a group of Muslims who do not believe that he was the first successor and that they believe that the person who usurped the successorship should have been the first successor and was legitimately the first successor, then this naturally raises a sore spot or a wounded area which they might feel we are rubbing salt into. I'd like to assure the viewers that whilst I was once in the game of polemics, whilst I was once in the game of engaging in these heated debates and I very much regret my role in perhaps offending the other camp and I very much regret the fact that I lowered myself to such a level it is nonetheless a discussion which must be had and we can only hope that the followers of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, and indeed anyone who follows the truth would engage in such a discussion with respect and with etiquette that is a promise you have for me on this show from the laws of Zahra. Whenever we discuss these contentious issues, I will not hide the truth from you, nor do I want to manipulate the truth in order to beautify the events of the past or gloss them over in a way in which you do not have the full recounting of events. For that would be an injustice to all of you, be you Sunni or Shia or indeed of any other religious background. Indeed, our intention on this show is to merely present the truth to you, present what has been narrated to us from the Ahlul Bayt. And indeed, they are of a progeny of the Holy Prophet They do not speak of their own desires. What they say is miraculously preserved and is the truth as is brought to us from the Holy Prophet they are indeed infallible narrators of history. Now, some people might not believe that, 
if they don't believe that, we can again come to the proofs from the book, the laws of Zahra proving that, which we indeed shall do. But the main issue that I wish to put across here is that I am not merely saying these things in order to offend. I'm not trying to glorify my understanding of history which has been presented to me from the Ahlul Bayt salam, in order to offend anyone. Indeed, we're not sectarian people. We're not a people who wish for bloodshed to be spilt. But indeed, that brings us back to the real reason for why we must discuss these events. Brothers and sisters, be you Sunni or Shia, be you anyone out there who has a concern for humanity, what we see in the world today is that the image of Islam has been tarnished. The image of Islam has been corrupted. Unfortunately, today we see that many people act in the name of the religion of Islam. They may carry banners. They may be willing to kill themselves and kill others in the name of what they believe is Islam. And yet we see there's a plethora of interpretation. This plethora of interpretation has people on all sides of the camp saying that we represent the true Islam. We represent the Islam which was revealed to the Holy Prophet and indeed they try to give textual verification or evidence for their position. We find that those who are hostile to Islam from the from numerous perspectives, be they militant atheists or occasionally Christian missionaries with an agenda to portray Islam in a negative light, often like to take the more radical, violent forms of so-called Islam, because we do not believe our Islam whatsoever, and portray them as the truth. Indeed, they might sometimes even bring out books and say, look, these guys are only doing what's in their books. And to some degree they're not mistaken. Many times these radicals are acting in the name of ancient texts, texts which claim to go back to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa And anyone who's a rational person out there is, in my opinion, correct to ask the question, how do we know what is the correct interpretation of Islam? And more importantly, People out there who are militant atheists might even be justified in asking, okay, that's fine, you claim that you're not like those violent extremist Muslims, but on what authority do you say that? Because we're all looking at sources here and they have their sources. And again, if Allah as a as you claimed, these militant atheists would say, of course, I'm not saying this myself, revealed the divine religion, then surely he would have a self-preservation mechanism out there. Surely he would have a mechanism to enlighten the believers as to what the correct interpretation is and prevent us from falling under deviant interpretations and from going out and harming other people in the name of Islam. Now of course this is a topic which is very sensitive to my own heart um, as a student of religion. I'm based here in Holy Karbala, beside the shrine of Imam al-Hussein salam, and I happen to have an opportunity to study when I'm out here. So one question I'm often asked as someone who comes from an originally non-Muslim background is my parents sometimes ask me, well, son, why is it you're out in the country where there's some renegades and radicals claiming to have established an Islamic state? Of course, whilst I've tried to explain, to clarify, and to give an understanding to my family that I'm not of that sect and far from it, if that sect got their hands on me, they'd want to kill me, it sometimes doesn't click because obviously they're not people who have studied the religion of Islam, they're not particularly sure of the khususiyat, the particular minor details of what the religion of Islam teaches. So when it comes to discussions with some of the more educated, enlightened members of my family, I'm often asked, well, you know, that's fine, you claim that God revealed this religion of Islam, and yet you have the majority of the people claiming to be Muslims, who are in the media today, representing Islam in a very filthy and negative manner. 
beheading people, hurting young women, selling people into slavery, killing people for being of another religion. Today in the newspaper I saw articles in which Christian men were violently mutilated on their bodies for merely being Christian. Now, the question could be asked, again, this crucial question I've been asked, how did God give, how could God, how could Allah Azawajal not give us a self-preservation mechanism to determine between true Islam and false Islam? We have that solution, brothers and sisters. We as Shia of Ali Muhammad, as people striving to be Shia of Ali Muhammad, indeed we should merely refer to ourselves as lovers of Ali Muhammad, believe that Allah Azawajal has given us infallible guides from the progeny of Ali Muhammad in order to break this cycle of interpretation, of interpretational chaos. Now what do I mean by that? I mean unless you have an infallible voice speaking in the name of a religious tradition then how can you ever determine that what you're saying is true and not merely another interpretation from amongst the plethora of interpretations we as Shias have the Ahlul Bayt we have the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa and indeed we have the Imams from his holy progeny and more importantly we have Fatima Fatima alayhi salam who came out when Islam was first distorted and came to teach humanity true Islam it is not something we like to discuss it is not something that was normally befitting for a woman to have to go and challenge the usurpers and dictators of her time indeed we as men we all wish to have a degree of a surety that our daughters, our wives, our sisters are kept safe from the brutality of men at times, from the brutality of vile men. And yet we find that one of the self-preservation mechanisms entrusted to us by Allah Azawajal, part of the prophetic project to preserve Islam, despite the fact that the Holy Prophet knew there would be an attempted usurpation of Islam, an attempt to what I call the Arab Spring over Islam, an attempt to destroy the religion of Islam through the roots of Islam by giving us false authorities and false interpretations, interpretations which we see today being manifest in Iraq here with the so-called establishment of caliphates. Allah Azawajal, through his divine hikmah, gave us Fatima. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa gave us Fatima. Now who is Fatima? Fatima is someone who is known to the Shia. He is known to the Sunnah, to the Sunnis rather. Big mistake on my part. If you are a non-Muslim or you, if you are a Muslim who does not know much about Fatima to Zahra, then stay tuned and join us for the next episode, inshallah ta'ala, in which we will be discussing who is Fatima and how the Prophet preserved the religion of Islam through her in the aftermath of his martyrdom. Hava wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ahla bayti at-tayyameen at-tahirin.